All right, I'm going to have to go through this a lot faster than the last time I tried doing this podcast because it ended up being 30 minutes, so here we go. Um, to start it off, I'm talking about how race was constructed and built into the U.S. economy. Um, the ways that I have seen race defined is based generally on the phenotype or the appearance of the person, um, and this is usually like skin color uh, in this example, and the economy is based on the uh, amount of goods and services that are sold or bought by a country. So um, to start it off, I'm going to talk about how these are intertwined. And they've been intertwined long before America was even a country. Um, back in the day, Spain, when they were becoming a power, global power, they uh, were, excuse me, colonizing many, many countries um, on their path to conquest. And their main slogan was God, gold, and glory. Um, and the one connection that I found really important about this in the week's one's notes uh, the saying God, gold, and glory, it perfectly uh, stratif or lays out everything that we're going to be talking about. God, religion, and becoming the um, formation of the in-group versus the out-group. Gold, uh, obviously the economy, and glory, kind of just becoming the best country that they think they can be. Um, they, uh, Spain eventually goes out and they colonize a ton of countries. Uh, and they start plantations and other things that they can do to make money um, in their conquest. Britain sees that other countries are making a lot of money, and they definitely hop on this bandwagon, and they take it to a whole nother level. Uh, they cultivate tobacco, uh, mostly, on their uh, colonies, which are across the British Americas, the British West Indies, uh, and... Really, this is the start of America, and the start of America's economy was based on slavery from the English. That uh, They got black people from Africa, they brought them across, these African Americans across, and they were thrown immediately into slavery because they were not part of the immediate in-group of the white people from Europe. Uh, and this was originally based on religion. Uh, if the people that they say in an example the black people from uh, or the africans had been um christian then a lot of slavery would not exist because christians were not allowed to enslave christians was the big deal um into the reader the indigenous people's history of the united states uh there are examples of settling uh colonies for economic gain um that was not only allowed by the state or the monarchies, but it was also endorsed by the papal authority, so the church. Um, again, tying in church being involved in racism between the economy and, um, and the states. Uh, I went on to White Settlers and the Eliminating Natives on page 27, and this kind of talked a little bit about miscegenation and the... Uh, uh, prevention of race mixing and this was pretty much just so that they could keep their in-group as visible as possible they didn't want to have to deal with mixed races so uh, it made saying or being able to identify who was potentially a slave or not much easier and uh, again people were making more money if they could identify a slave off of just appearance um, in page 47 in the reader, uh, under Building the Racist Foundation, uh, they talk about, uh, by the uh, just good quotes on slavery and the economy how, and how it was based on it, by the 18th century, the slavery-centered society directly involved a large portion of white America and all major social classes. Everyone was making money based off slavery. Um, they also state if there had been no African-American enslavement, there probably would not have been a huge North American wealth generation and possibly no modern wealth generating British and American capitalism on the massive scale that developed over the centuries. Huge, huge amounts of money were gained through slavery. It was a ridiculously lucrative business, and it wasn't just plantations that utilized slavery to make money. Um, on page 58 in the reader, uh, this does not have a title. Uh, I think it's the Apocalypse of Settler Colonialism, maybe. Um, it talks about the percentage of slavery business owned by England, which was 
who founded the Americas. Um, and big takeaway is in 1690, England had 90% of the share of slave trade in the world, which is huge. And they made lots of money off that. They, they had a triangle kind of going between Africa, Europe, uh, England, and the Americas, where the English would go down, pick up the slaves in Africa. They would go and bring the slaves to the Americas where they would work in, you know, these colonies and make a bunch of, uh, they'd get these products like tobacco or cotton or, you know, harvest these crops. And then those goods would immediately go to England where they would be, you know, made into something more useful and then sold. Um, we're going to skip a lot of America because there's a lot that goes on, but it's not too much involved in the economy. It still has some intertwining facets but um the big thing i want to take away on this is page 203 in the reader on uh the eyes on the prize of civil rights reader number two is um really interesting and it's it focuses more on the race not necessarily the economic side of this but um it was how children learn about race uh and it basically says that children aren't it's not an innate thing to realize someone's race uh which i think most people understood uh nowadays at least um and uh kind of how people were taught these uh ideas and behaviors which again is not a good thing um i don't know if we could potentially completely eradicate it but it's worth a shot um the one thing i talked about in the last podcast i recorded that i really thought was good was um when they were talking about the dolls and the preferences, uh, I think, you know, the whole standard of beauty comes from people just trying to sell to the majority of their audience. Uh, so like in, I said in the last podcast, I have a um, African-American friend who is in the influencing industry for makeup and uh, they have complained um, about like beauty products not being made for uh, the darker skin complexions. And, um, you know, him and I had talked about it and, you know, we came up with the idea that the, and I think most people understand this, is the majority of the audience in the, you know, skincare and skin products, beauty products, uh, is the majority of the United States. The majority tends to be, you know, it still is white uh, or lighter complexion. So the companies, it makes sense for them to have a somewhat, al- albeit somewhat racist, uh, business plan where they direct their products towards a white or fair complexion audience uh, which excludes some people from utilizing these products but or outcast them or ostracizes them i guess um but it from a business standpoint it makes more money that way so um kind of an intertwining of the races and the economy even today in a more uh recent example another more modern example of racism and the economy being intertwined is the war on drugs and the incarceration system. The war on drugs was started in 1982. Um, Really quickly, it was uh, Ronald Reagan who announced the war on drugs and they really cracked down on people utilizing drugs and some people had claimed that the drugs had not even been in these minority uh, minority areas until the government actually introduced them they think um big takeaways on page 262 are that in less than 30 years the u.s penal population exploded from around 300,000 to more than 2 million with the war on drugs accounting for the majority of these increases so not you know severe crimes like murder rape or other things i guess um but you know it was really really cracked down on um and then the other thing on there was that it had the u.s uh, in those 30 years grew to the highest rate of incarceration in the world um dwarfing the rates of nearly every other developed country uh for example germany 93 people are in prison for every hundred thousand adults and children in the u.s the rate is nearly eight times that at 750 per hundred thousand which is huge um you know having someone in prison removes them from a family system and you know not having a complete family unit uh two parents whatever parents gender or 
belief system, you know, that doesn't matter. But as long as you have a family unit, you are much more likely to succeed as a human, um, as an individual. Um, but another thing that they brought in was that prison, which indirectly or in kind of discriminately affects minority communities, um, they brought up on 261 that um, today it's perfectly legal to discriminate against criminals in nearly all the ways that it was once legal to discriminate against African Americans. Um, once you're labeled a felon, the old forms of discrimination, employment discrimination, housing discrimination, denial of the right to vote, denial of education opportunity, denial of food stamps and other public benefits, uh, exclusion from jury services, and not listed in here, but another big one is the uh, denial of the right to have a firearm. You lose the right to own a firearm. You lose your Second Amendment uh, once you become a felon, which everyone who got taken into the prisons in that explosion of the war on drugs, uh, they got hit by that. Um, they compare being a criminal nowadays to having scarcely more rights and arguably less respect than a black man living in Alabama at the height of Jim Crow, which Jim Crow, everyone can agree, was a severely racist era. Um, so they kind of argue that racism takes a new face in the sense that it's not based strictly on race, but it's more so based on uh you're in your felon status if you're a felon or not um so i hope you kind of can see a way that uh race and the economy have been intertwined especially since oh i forgot to mention prison systems not all prisons are state owned or government operated uh some are privatized so it's an industry they make money off of people being incarcerated um and you know uh the majority of people incarcerated are minorities which you know it can be problemat problematic um you know and uh race definitely that that in its own could be studied a bit more and uh we should view it as a society and what we uh value but um race is definitely tied into the <laughs> economy of the united states they uh, it almost always has been and it almost always will be um you know, we started out as a plantation kind of industrial colony and race with slavery gave us free labor and helped us grow to the country that we are today. But um, race in industries like beauty, modeling, TV, acting, all of these, you know, the race of the person who is um, buying the product uh, definitely affects who gets to, who the product's designed for, I guess is a good way to put it. And then, um, on top of that, the prison system, uh, being able to m profit off of, uh, taking minorities out of the homes and putting them into these, uh, penal systems is, uh, kind of disturbing. And the way that people are treated after becoming a felon is uh also something i think we should look at and in, in terms of legislation anyways um i really try to speed that through uh this still might be a little bit long but i hope you uh kind of enjoyed my flow of consciousness on these uh topics thank you and have a good day